All right, so here are some problems from the OpenStax textbook. And again, I'm just going to do some, not, not all of these here. These are on the homework. So from Chapter 4, Newton's Laws of Motion, this is really simple, a 63 kilogram sprinter and this acceleration. Just multiply the two and you come up with the force, what it's asked for. The original problem here is in the OpenStax textbook. There it is. So 63 kilogram sprinter starts a race with an acceleration of 4.20 meters per second squared. What is the net external force on him? And so plugging in the parameter, I did something off cosine and sine the other day. Clear, that's what I wanted. Okay, so all it is is 63 times 4.2. enter and there it is 265 newtons rounded as you can see three significant figures all right i have a little bit of follow-up here so i posted here the supplied acceleration 4.2 should be relatively easy to confirm by simply analyzing video footage of sprint races and i found this article so here it is profiling elite male 100 meter sprint performance the role of maximum velocity in relative acceleration and it gets into looks like a lot of detail here but um it's really actually all straightforward because all you have to do is look at video analysis and let's see um really fast 10.17 seconds for the 100 meters plus minus 0.23 the range this is the world record 9.58 that's Usain Bolt and so this is what they looked at um, Olympic Games World Championships I think this one is the one World Championship Berlin 2009 that's 9.58 um, and then so on and so on and oh there's actually this kind of looks like no no this is um, looks like an interesting equation here I it apparently describes the distance here and then there is an exponential in there exponential function all right uh, because the entire race is actually not completely smooth so I analyze actually this is the only number that I use the 1.752 here for the first 10 meters and that's I noticed that's actually the highest acceleration they have um, in fact yeah it starts a race and so I came up with this one here when I plugged that in the 1.72 752 meters per uh, seconds for the first 10 meters I come up with an average acceleration of 6.53 meters per second squared which is appreciably um, not faster but it's appreciably larger in acceleration than the 4.20 mentioned in the problem which leads me to the conclusion that yeah the sprinter in the physics problem is good but not world-class okay let me just go back to this one here this is actually an interesting um, table here um, I noticed that when you plug in these numbers here 2.187 you come up for the first 20 meters you come up with 5.0 meters per second squared so their fastest acceleration or their largest acceleration is early on and then their acceleration peters out which means which makes sense because at some point they reach their top speed at which point they have no more acceleration uh, when I go to let's see oh, oh when I look at the times here these are also kind of kind of interesting so on the first 10 meters they use the largest amount of time that makes sense because they just started with velocity zero then on the next 10 meters they use only 1.1 seconds and then it, then on the next 10 meters and so on um, they're getting faster and faster you can see this here 0 0.9 seconds 0 0.9 seconds 0 0.8 seconds and then they slow down one second and then I'm not sure what happened here 0.7 seconds that's an interesting one I didn't notice that before and then here it's 1.1 second <laughs> are they going through through a slump right here and then they speed up again and that's just kind of strange um, but they're definitely getting slower towards the end of the race or that's why they have their peak velocity all right actually that's uh, what I had for this problem it took me a little bit longer for a very simple problem actually because I talk a lot. Okay, I'm gonna give myself a break. All right, so the next problem that I'm gonna do here is um, I'll leave you the cleaner. So the same rocket sled and so on, 
this is the original problem. So same rocket sled as in the previous example, and the Bergs decelerated at the rate of 196 meters per second squared. That's 20 Gs. What force is necessary to do, reduce this acceleration? So here it is how to do it. And again, it starts with force equals mass times acceleration, and then you just need to plug in the given numbers. So 2100 times 196, which comes out to 412,000 newtons, which is what they wrote down here. Again, in my homework and practice tests and unit exams, do not use scientific notation. Blackboard doesn't like that. So 412,000 newtons. Uh, what about significant figures? That's three here. And the 2,100, it looks like it's a rounded number, two significant figures. So technically, it should be 410,000, which is what I try to discuss here um, in this little footnote here, that, well, it's a, it's the ambiguous case for the zero. So either one, 412,000 or 410,000, would work for me, um, depending on yeah how you round it, because the 2,100 is kind of ambiguous is it two three four we kind of assume it's two right um, in fact I do say that here as mentioned before what I mean by that is perhaps in a previous lecture I've, I've mentioned before that I'm not totally picky about the number of, of significant figures so if you give me one or less that's fine just don't give me all eight from the calculator okay all right next problem I'm gonna give myself a break um, I'm going to do the one with the trampoline here. There it is. So again, I'll leave the motorcycle for you. And I noticed, yeah, I did have some photos pictured here. So this is the 2012 Olympic Games. And let's see what else I have here. Here's the rocket sled. And there's the motorcycle. And so I'm going to do the trampoline here. This is a nice to watch. They're, they're going pretty nice high um, and have a large hang time. Okay, so let's look at the original problem for the trampoline. All right, I'm gonna scroll down here. Quite a few of these space rocket sled problems and so on. So, oh gosh, do I pass? Oh, there it is, there's the trampoline one. Okay, so trampoline, I have to apply 45 kilograms in Mr. Accelerator straight up at this acceleration. Note that the answer is independent of the velocity of the gymnast. I will explain that one. Uh, can be, the, she can be moving either up or down or be stationary. I'll be talking about that, explaining that once I'm actually done with the problem. So one of the things is that the gymnast is getting an upward acceleration seven, at 7.50 meters per second squared. But of course, she or he, is it she? Her. Um, has to, she has to fight gravity, which is trying to pull her down by 9.8. So actually, she has to make that much up on top. So technically, she actually accelerates with 17.3 meters per second squared. And again, then subtracting gravity gets her to the essential 7.50 meters per second squared. But we'll see that in the algebra. So let's look at the algebra. I had to take a little break here because I wanted to spice this up, not spice up, but make this a little bit more clear here. So this is where I started out. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. That's Newton's second law. And then in this case, the sum of the acceleration is the normal force exerted by the trampoline plus the weight from the person. And again, this is where I started out. They already kind of implied the algebra here, but, but I want to explicitly show that. So notice when I have the sum of the forces, I actually write them as plus plus, and technically they also should be vectors. This one is going to be only in the vertical, so I can leave out the vectors, but I have to pay attention to which is positive and which is negative. And again, when I start out with this, the way I write the forces in, they're both positive. Now I'm going to continue and so here I have it again. Oh, and then I might. Oh, now I have to stop again. Because I made a slight writing mistake. I have to fix my writing mistake. All right, I think I fixed it. And you can see the new word thus right there. 
And so this is it. This is the sum of the force equals mass times acceleration. I have to pay attention to that my normal force ought to come out positive, that the weight is actually negative, but the weight is mass times negative gravity. In fact, I wrote it down here. I don't, didn't write it on the side, but there it is. Mass times negative gravity. G itself is a positive number, 9.80. But when I plug it in for the weight, then, of course, I have to plug in the negative G, negative 9.80. So mass times negative 9.80 is what it is. Where, this negative, where the second negative comes from, I'll show you in a moment. So here, normal force plus weight, which, again, in my back of my head is actually a negative number, equals mass times acceleration. The acceleration should also be positive because she is, has a positive acceleration upward. So I, put the, I make the algebra step of subtracting the weight from the other side. This is where the second negative comes in, right there. So normal force is mass times acceleration minus the weight. Then mass times acceleration minus, well, the weight is negative anyway, so we get a double negative, which of course then is a positive right there. That's what I said earlier. You actually, it turns out you actually add 7.5 plus 9.80. I put a three dots here because now I can go back to the solution manual, which then states the same thing, 7.5 plus 9.80. So technically she actually, trampoline actually has to exert, so to say, 17.3 meters per second squared of the force equivalent to that, which is the 779. Newtons, here's the calculation. So, of course, I mean, it's in front of us, 45 times 7.50 plus 9.80. Oops. And then we round to, yeah, 3 sig fig is what's given in the problem, so 779 Newtons. So, again, the weight actually is a negative but because I put it on the other side that's why I subtract the negative which then of course becomes a positive all right so what about this here there are apparently three scenarios so when we count when we compute an acceleration when we have an acceleration given it tells us in which direction the velocity is changing it doesn't tell us in which direction the object, in this case the gymnast, is moving. That's why they're distinguishing here between three different ways. The typical thing would be for us to say that she can be moving either up, at which point she accelerates 7.5 meters per second squared upward and is getting faster upward. But she could also be coming down with a certain speed, and now the trampoline is slowing her down by the same acceleration pointing upward still pointing upward 7.50 which because she is moving down slows her down to zero or she could be simply stationary and starting there and she puts enough force onto the trampoline which then accelerates her upward right after she is stationary so that's why there's why they're distinguishing between three different ways of what she can actually do all right, give myself a break here before I get to the next problem. All right, so I gave myself a little break so I can do the next problem. Turns out my little break actually took all afternoon. You know, other things came up. So here we go. Next one is about, suppose, a 60 kilogram gymnast and so on. So here's the original problem. Suppose a 60 kilogram gymnast climbs a rope. What is the tension in the rope if he climbs at a constant speed? What's the tension in the rope if he accelerates upward at a certain rate? So the first one is really straightforward. If it says constant speed, that means acceleration is zero. That means in Newton's second law that the sum of the forces is zero, which means that the tension needs to equal the weight. You know, he's climbing up at a constant speed. He actually doesn't need any extra force to go upward if he's already moving because he already is moving. So inertia gets him going and all he needs to do is have enough force to counteract gravity. So it's basically 60 times 9.8, which is close to 600 newtons. Um, I think top of my head it's like 588 newtons. We'll look at that in just a moment. Oh, yeah, in fact, here it is. So there it is. There's the 588 newtons. I sometimes rewrite what they have in a solution manual 
uh, for certain reasons. I always like to start out with this here. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. In this case, sum of the forces is force tension plus weight, and that equals zero in this case because comes of velocity. And then I rearrange terms, and there, you know, the weight goes on the other side, and we have a negative here in front. And then there it is actually tension equals um, the negative weight. You know, tension is upward, weight is negative right there is negative and pointing down and therefore with the double negative here that means that the tension is positive and then we plug in numbers 9.8 times 60 588 newtons I don't think I need to take out the calculator okay again I just give myself a little break all right back from this one really was a little break notice that I did it a little bit different because I actually didn't like it the way I wrote it first um, I really want to start out sum of the force equals mass times acceleration and then I plug in on the left hand side these are my forces tension and weight on the right hand side it says acceleration equals zero and that's all another thing I want to point out is that there's a number of physics books that do the following they invent new symbols for various forces I personally don't like that I always like to call my forces capital F no matter what um, and then I put an index there that says well this is a force for tension this is the force for weight but at least I have all the same symbols here for force no matter which force it is all right let me go to the next one here so again I start out Newton's second law and it's again tension and weight and this time there is actually an acceleration so I'm going to leave that there now I'm going to do the algebra they want me to figure out what the tension is so I subtract the weight here remember that the weight itself is actually negative so when I plug it in right here there's that negative g being a positive number and again I get a double negative which gives me a positive right there and now the rest is the same as what you can see here from the solution manual so overall the tension must be greater than the weight because that person is actually accelerating upward I did and then yeah the answer is apparently 678 newtons so a little bit larger than than the weight of the person okay I did find a pretty good video for this one here which I just inserted I was about not to do anything here for the climbing rope I hope this is going to show in my Hey, Ben with Block Prep here, and um, today we're going to talk about a simple road recording. I'm going to go a little bit so, forward, so let's listen to him. Climb is one in which I clamp my legs, I clamp my feet onto the rope, and then I go up the rope simply by standing up. So I clamp and stand, clamp and stand. All right, another, and that's what I wanted to point out that he clamps and stands, and before that, he says. Um, a misconception is that we pinch the rope between the feet but instead he actually stands which means if you look carefully here in this video you can actually see that one foot lifts part of the rope so that he makes a sling in there and that's what he means this is where he's actually standing and he argues that our legs are much stronger than our, our um, arms and therefore it's that technique makes it actually a whole lot easier all right then he also says clamp and stand clamp and stand and so the first one with the constant velocity that's actually unrealistic because he cannot keep up the constant velocity he doesn't even try and so what he does is he clamps at which point he stands and now he pulls himself up respectively yeah points down with it with his foot and then he can reach his arms further up one at a time and that's actually where he accelerates upward so the second part is actually one but only for a short moment because then he's going to stand again and he needs to get his legs further up and so on so that yeah the second one just for a short amount of times that could be for a very short amount of time 1.50 meters per second squared that sounds realistic all right again a little break for myself All right, the next one, calculate the force and so on, and the original, oops, it's a little bit off the screen, there we go. Um, and then I'm going to look at here, this is the original problem, so, oh, where did it go? Which number was it now? 25, I didn't highlight that? Hmm. No, I didn't, I forgot to highlight that. Calculate the force of a high jumper, must exert on ground to produce an upward acceleration four times the acceleration due to gravity, wow. Explicitly show how you follow steps and so on. All right, so 
Uh, let's see. So there's the problem on the homework. And then I'm going to go over here to the solution menu. Same problem here. And here we go. Again, I'm, I'm starting with the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And then the sum of the forces, the two forces that are there, and then there is an acceleration, that's what it says on for this high jumper, he, he or she needs to accelerate, and I made a tiny mistake there. This is no longer tension in this one here, this is the normal force. So the high jumper pushes down on the ground, and then the ground pushes up on him, Newton's third law. There Actually, there were a few times in here that I could have talked about Newton's third law, in the action reaction forces okay so anyway i get this one here and then i'm again solving for the normal force and there's the algebra and again there's a double negative here which means he needs to exceed gravity of course and it says four times as much which means this acceleration here must be four times as much and we can see that here there that's 9.8 times 4 39.2 at the 9.8 that's 49 49 times 70, 70, we plug this into a calculator, we have, well, the same answer. That's what the solution manual got. 3,430, is it? Oh, it is three significant figures, 3,430 newtons. All right, what I found here is this video here by someone who is really enthusiastic about ba basketball, so he made his own website. If you listen to him, he has a German accent, just like me. And so I'm going to scroll down here, and he did a, I know there's a lot of advertisement here. This is the graph that I, that I want to look at. So he says, hey, this is where I'm going to jump up and notice this 1,000 here. So he ca just called it 100 kilograms. That would be actually the weight. He needs to exceed his own weight to, to make it larger. And, and of course, this is a basketball player. It's not a high jump. Okay, so he doesn't get to four times as much, not to 4,000 newtons for his 100 kilogram body, I guess, but only to 2,000 or a little bit more. And in this short amount of time, and then the rest over here is, this is actually when he comes back. <laughs> you know, he, so he has a hang time of about 25 seconds. And so on, and then he goes to the calculations. And anyway, there, here he actually calculates the impulse and then he uses the impulse. Let's see, there's a little bit more right uh, right here. There we go. This is actually the impulse that, that he gets, 315 newton seconds. This is actually um, just before he jumps upward. So he relaxes there a little bit, respectively. He actually push, um, the ground pushes up a little bit more on him before he really takes off. So it's the 315 newton second here, which he then calculates, and he goes on and comes up with, oh, there it is, a lift of speed of 2.4 meters per second, and then he calculates from that, that with that he can actually achieve a height of 30 centimeters, which actually way short of what he does achieve when you watch this video, because he actually achieves almost one meter. But I think he just got that diagram from using an actual platform that can measure the forces. So... And, and then, as I said, the 2,000 newtons here, the other one, you know, four times as much actually would be 4,000, actually 5,000 newtons. Of course, that would be a high jumper who needs to get much higher than the um, one meter that might be required for dunking the basketball. So anyway, yeah, there is a little video here as well for him right there. All right. Again, I'm going to give myself a break for the... Next problem. All right, the next problem. So I'm going to skip that one here. I'll let you do that. Um, I guess just the one with the cooking breakfast, by the way, just a photo here of bratwurst in a, in a frying pan. Anyway, and then I'm, but here I'm saying something, previous statement, thing about physics while doing the ordinary is typical of at least one physics instructor, which is me. And whatever I do, whatever situation I am, I am in, and I let my mind wander, hopefully not too bad, um, then, you know, driving a car, kayaking, skiing, and anything, I do think about the physics of, of it and how it applies. And many times it is actually Newton second, Newton second law, because it's pretty much in all, any one of these activities that I just described. It could be something, forces are acting on it, accelerations or velocities zero and uh, at constant and then how do the forces add up and so on and there could be other things i think about the physics of 
cooking, making coffee or something like that. So anyway, I'm going to skip this one here with the breakfast. And then I'm going to have here, suppose you have 120 kilogram wooden crates. So I'm going to go here. And let's see, there it is. So wooden crate resting on a wood floor. What maximum force can you exert horizontally in the crate without moving it? And if you continue to exert this force, once the crate starts to slip, what will the magnitude of its acceleration then be? I'm going to get to this one here where apparently they put in here wooden crate and wood floor. Not just any crate, not just any floor, but both of them are wooden. I'll show that in just a moment why that will be important. Let me see, there was a reason. Oh, yeah, yeah, here I wanted to um, show this one here. So this little diagram, which is from the OpenStax textbook, all it's missing is actually the person which is trying to push this one here. So direction of motion or attempted motion here. And then, yes, friction points in the opposite direction. That, that makes sense. Of course, when we say opposite here, it always means actually Newton's second law. Because Newton's second law is always for forces that act on the same object. Okay, so it's only Newton's third law with the equal and opposite force when the two forces are acting on two different objects that interact with each other, such as me pushing down with my feet onto the floor and the floor pushing up on me. But pretty much all these problems that we talk about here are Newton's second laws, so the forces are acting on just one object and yes occasionally we do need Newton's third law to explain the situation so in any case what's missing actually here's the person I guess they could have put um, that one in there the person and here I'm gonna go with why the wood is important in this problem here so here is the book and I go back to the chapter oh, there's the same diagram and let's see there we go so each material touching any other material produces a different kind of friction coefficient. And so this table that you see here, where there's about 15 different ones on here, could go on f into the thousands, because you might have hundreds of materials that could actually slide or move across 100 other different materials, and then you have 10,000 uh, friction coefficients. So that's why they had to point out wood on wood, and both of these numbers are important here. So for static friction, this is apparently, it's 0.5. And for kinetic friction, it's lower, 0.3. These are experimental values where you would have to look them up in, in a book. Um, by the way, the difference here, notice that static friction is usually larger than kinetic friction. You actually kind of know that. If you put a car in neutral on the parking lot and you push it, it actually doesn't take that much force. And then you get to push it. And then once it's moving, rolling, it's actually easier to push, which means that the static friction starting it is actually larger than the kinetic friction once it's already moving. In any case, we need the 0.5 and the 0.3 here. And uh, what else did I want to say there? Oh, they have no units, these coefficient, friction coefficients. All right, let's go. I wanted to show something else, which is this one here. Oh, I got to it in just a moment. Hold on. Let's yeah look at the problem here. Is that, by the way, problem four, problem five? It's problem four. Okay. All right, so here's the same problem and so on, and there I did it for us. And again, I'm writing it down again here. Sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. The applied force from the person plus the static friction. And then we have the maximum. And this is where an interesting things come in. What is the static friction actually and what is the formula for it? Well, static friction depends on the normal force. The larger the normal force is that the, that the floor, the ground exerts on the object, the larger is friction. And that's where I wanted to show the other diagrams. So this one here with ice on ice, which is, by the way, is that on here? Yes, there it is. Very small, right? 0 0.1 versus 0 0.0 three here for for the ice for static and kinetic friction versus the for for the one wood on wood is much larger so anyway i think we can agree that the second one is harder to do than the first one than the one on the left because on the second one he's pushing down on the ice and therefore he's adding to the weight an extra force that is pointing downward making producing a larger normal force 
for the ice, the lake that he's on, pushing upward. And so that larger force pushing upward produces a larger frictional force, which he tries to needs to work against. That's why this one is harder. Here, this one is easier because gravity is pulling down, but he was already acting against gravity by pulling it up a little bit because he is at an angle as well. And so that means that the normal force from the ice pushing that ice up is smaller as well. And therefore, the friction isn't as much. So that's why pushing is harder than pulling. If you do it under the angle, if you push down and if you pull up, then yeah, pushing is harder. So going back here, that was my explanation on why the static friction or the kinetic friction as well depends on the normal force. Then the normal force itself, well, has to match the weight. In this case, they actually assume that they're pushing the crate horizontally, so no angle involved here. We don't need a sine or a cosine here. So that means that the normal force is simply the opposite of the weight. Again, same object, Newton's second law still. So therefore, and then the weight itself is actually negative. So when I plug that in, I actually come out with a positive. And so the static friction is actually the friction coefficient times the normal force. And then it turns out because the normal force is the negative of the weight, the negative, the weight itself being negative. Coefficient friction, friction coefficient times mass times gravity. Notice that all these numbers are positive, and that's what I'm trying to explain here. So in the problem itself, they don't tell us in which direction it moves. So let's just say it is moving to the right. That means that the applied force must be positive. And that means that the static friction must be in the opposite direction, just like the diagram we looked at earlier for the crate. So that would have to be negative, which means I actually kind of have to invent another negative. Sorry, it makes it a little bit more complicated here. We already had two negatives that took care of each other. And now we have yet another one, which due to the algebra is actually gone again. So we came up across like four negatives here uh, for a different reason, each one for, different, for a different reason. So pretty much here, the applied force plus the static friction is zero. The thing is not moving. It could be also a constant velocity, but it says it's sitting there. So it's not moving, and that simply means then that the applied force is this one here. And notice when you plug in positive numbers, you will come up with a positive number. So 0.5 times 120 is 60 times 9.8 is just short of 600, and there it is, 588 newtons. All right, the second part here is, and, and by the way, the friction coefficient is the 0.5 here for the static friction. Notice that on the next one, they're actually using a 0.3 because it's already moving, so the kinetic friction. So again, starting with Newton's second law, and actually let me fix it just a little bit. I think I don't need this, actually. There we go. I'm just going to take that out. And so sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And then for the same reasoning here for the kinetic friction and normal force and weight, so there it is. This time, they want us to figure out what the acceleration is given a certain applied force. Did they say that? Oh, yeah. Once it's moving, actually, you apply the same 588 newtons. But now you're able to do it because it's already moving. And then the friction is actually less. The kinetic friction is less than the static friction. That's why you see the 352. So here it is, and it's asking for... The acceleration so you do the algebra which means take the sum of the forces right there divide by the mass and that's what I did over here and then again I plug that in here the mu k mg which is exactly what they're doing here as well in solution menu there are these three numbers and then subtract that from the given 588 newtons because it said again you continue with the same force that you just determined and you come up with an acceleration of 1.96 meters per second squared, 2 meters per second squared. That's pretty fast, actually, pretty large acceleration. You're not going to be able to keep that up for long, just a fraction of a second, perhaps. Uh, with, Alex, with accelerations, those are interesting unless you have a rocket that continues accelerate, that con continuously accelerates, or you have someone in a 100 meter dash who accelerates for the first 80 meters or so. You pretty much have accelerations only for short amounts of time or maybe you go from 30 to 50 miles per hour and you have it like for 10 seconds but then 
you know, stop accelerating and because you can't anymore. You don't have enough force left, enough energy to um, accelerate much faster than that. All right. Uh, let's see. The next one, again, a little break here. All right. So for this one here, I do have a skydiving video right here. So terminal velocity of a person falling in the air. The original problem is, oh, let's see. I have to go. Where did it go? There we go. Depends upon the weight and the area of the person and, and so on and fluid and then the head first position. The video that I got here is not a head first position, but I chose it here. I think I say that here because it confirms the terminal velocity computing the problem. Doesn't show head first jumps, yeah, but it is quite instructional for physics, including showing the force vectors for gravity and drag. So they do that very nicely. And this website here is if you go to it, this is actually um, computing that terminal velocity and it's pretty large I think it was like 400 kilometers an hour 300 250 miles an hour um, for some something like that for going head first so it's it's pretty fast all right anyway let's look at the algebra here this one here is a problem is an equation that you will find in the book so you just have to take it the way it's listed there so it's velocity squared equals two times mass times gravity divided by the density of air divided by the drag coefficient and divide by the area that encounters the air which in this case would be just the helmet from from the head and when you plug in all these numbers that are given in the problem there's the solution and yes i did look that up 400 kilometers per hour which is about 250 miles an hour and here's the calculation let's see plugging in the numbers and then no matter what i do i'm kind of on top i need to see it all i'm going to clear this here first so because of the velocity squared i take the square root so two times the given mass 80 kilograms times gravity divide by and i better put my denominator and parentheses when I use it here and then the 1210 kilograms per cubic meter that's the density of air notice that no 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 that's not true that's not true I forgot something 1.210 kilograms per cubic meter yeah it was it threw me off because I was about to mention that the density of water is 1000 kilograms cubic meters so about 800 times larger makes sense times the drag coefficient that is apparently given falling through air and times then apparently the 0.14 square meters would be the cross section of the helmet and notice that the square is not associated with that that's just belongs to the unit close that parentheses and close the parentheses for the um, For the square roots and i come up with around 115 meters per second which i then multiply with 3.6 to get that 414 kilometers per hour and i can also divide by 1.6 and get 260 miles per hour so yeah you can get quite fast there again a little break all right next problem is this one here by what factor does the drag force and so on and the original problem is here when you go from 65 to 110 kilometers per hour and here the thing is that the drag force goes with the square of the velocity by the way kinetic friction actually almost stays the same but depending on the air resistance it could depth actually could go with the square of the velocity and, and you notice that that when you ride a bicycle it's actually getting harder to ride against the air and the only thing that i pulled here is this diagram here where it shows i think we have to make this a little bit bigger here is the kinetic friction which stays the same pretty much no, no matter what the speed is and then here it would be the air resistance and that kind of looks like a parabola part of parabola which means yeah you are going uh it increases with the square of the velocity so here is 
how to calculate it. They don't really give us an equation. They just say, well, the two velocity, it depends on the square of the velocity. So we're just supposed to figure out what the ratio is. Um, between the two drag forces at a smaller speed versus a larger speed. So just divide the squares of those and you come up with 2.9. All right, again, a little break. All right, so here this is for a centripetal force. And I'll let you do this here one with the rotating space station. And I think I mentioned here that there are lots of videos out there for these hypothetical rotating space stations and I just chose one at random here. So I'm gonna do the other problem, the one with the merry-go-round for this 22 kilogram child. Uh, I found this video here and this one is worth watching because of this one here. Notice that when the girl actually falls off, this guy over here really makes it rotate really fast. So at some point one of the girls falls off and you can clearly see that she is falling forward. It's the inertia. There is no force outward. There's only a force inward that before she falls off, as she's rotating, she's holding on to the bar that is on there. And that is the centripetal force. That, and that makes it tough for her because that tension is in her muscles and her arms holding on to it. And that force is inward that actually keeps her rotating. Unless she can't do it anymore, she lets go and she falls forward tangentially from the merry-go-round. All right, let's look at the original problem. So, oh, give me a moment because I have to go to another chapter. All right, found it, there it is, chapter six. So this child here, merry go around 40 revolutions per minute. That's pretty fast, <laughs> one revolution in 1.5 seconds. What centripetal force must she exert to stay on it if she is 1.25 meters from the center? And what centripetal force and so on compete, compare each force with her weight? So here's the solution. This is the centripetal force. I actually like to write it as mass times velocity squared over the radius. They're actually writing it mass times radius times the angle of velocity squared. Same thing, just one algebra step away. And they give us what the angular acceleration is, the um, 40 revolutions per minute. So that's actually the, the frequency here. So just plugging in numbers, so 22 times the 1.25 given in the problem, and then the 40 revolutions per minute need to be, that's actually the frequency need to be converted for one thing, divide by 60 seconds. That's what, uh, what I said a moment ago, 1.5 revolutions per second. Um, no, actually the other way around, 1.5 seconds for each revolution. So still divided by 1.5 and then multiply by 2 pi in order to get the total circumference there, then time, and, and then that would be the angle of velocity. That's the definition of it. So plugging in numbers, of course, I would do the same thing as they're doing here with the same numbers. So let's see, 22 times the radius times 2 pi times the 40 divided by 60 seconds to get it from minutes to seconds, parentheses, and then the angle of velocity is squared, so there it is, enter, and that one is 482, 83 rounded, 483 newtons, just like they did, and then when I do the other one, let's see, I'm going to do this one here, and then, wow, that's 8 meters radius. That's a huge one. That's a huge merry-go-round. And then the now we have much fewer revolutions per minute, so that actually takes 20 seconds per minute. So 3 there, right there. The rest stays the same. Enter, and we come up with 17.4 newtons. So in the second one, because it's rotating faster and she's further out, that's why the force is much less so and then they compare it simply divide by her weight which is 22 kilograms times 9.8 so roughly 220 newtons for the first one a little bit more than two times and this is of course in the horizontal and so she has to exert a force that is twice as much as gravity and then you can 
figure out, wow, that's a lot of force, and the second one, very little, actually. All right, and with that, I'm done with these OpenStax text problems, or at least some of them that you find on the homework.